Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. I'm Carlos Paz, and today I'm going to be speaking about how to add value as a product manager in an ML team. But first, just a quick introduction. So as I said, I'm Carlos Paz, um, born and raised in Peru, but now I've been living in Europe for the last almost 10 years, working at different companies as a mm -hmm. product manager, as a senior product manager. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn also if you have any questions, maybe after the talk. Uh, you can find all the links on my uh, website as well and please also check the productbookclub.com which is a monthly book club that we do with other product managers and authors of the books and um, so you can also join us and, and discuss online maybe a bit of background uh, about the talk so this happened to me when I joined a new team and I was introduced as the new product manager for this new machine learning uh, team, right? And the, the imposter syndrome, of course, uh, kicked in, right? I knew a bit about the technology. I had read about it. I have seen some videos, but I was, okay, so what can I actually do? How can I actually add value to the team, right? Um, so that is what made me uh, realize that this is something that maybe I can share my experiences with, my learnings, because I did that with all colleagues that kept joining other ML teams. And there were always some recurrent uh, questions and, and, and things that I was able to share. So that's what I want to share on the talk today. So the agenda, just some quick definitions to make sure that uh, we all understand the same things. What are the differences between the normal product teams and the ML teams? Highlighting these differences also might help you already to realize how it is that you can add value to these teams. Uh, and then finally, some small recap of what you can do tomorrow and every day as a PM in these kind of teams. So on definition, I, I already assume you know what machine learning is, what AI is, right? Um, and what product management is, of course. If not, well, the internet is your best friend. There's a lot of definition, a lot of content about it. So on the kind of definition that I wanted to focus on today was on what am I actually calling an ML team? And from experience, what I see is that mainly there are two types of these ML teams. Uh, what I call an ML platform team. So for example, Uber will have this ML platform that they call Michelangelo. And then there will be the applied ML teams, right? So they use the technology of machine learning to solve a user problem, but they don't develop the platform itself, right? So another ex example is uh, Spotify. I think their ML platform, they call it ML Home. So there's a team in charge of that platform. And then there is a team that uses the technology to make some recommendations, for example, right? So this is dif uh, this is. Um, key to differentiate. So today I'm going to focus on uh, applied ML teams, which I think is, is are the more common ones now. So to begin, what are the differences with ML teams, right? And of course, there are a lot of differences. There are a lot of similarities with the uh, classical product teams, let's say. But I want to focus on the, on the main ones or the things that also impacted how I then ended up focusing my time when I was part of these teams. The first one is that there is, I believe, a bit more complex product specification. Defining a product is always uh, a bit difficult to, to define, of course, with your team. But on traditional so software, you can sort of write, uh, have, do a wireframe and then discuss it with a designer, with the developers, and it's easier to convey your idea, right? But when you're in charge of an ML product, um, the wireframe is not going to be enough, right? There are a lot more things that are more abstract that you need to define and that will really influence how your product performs, right? So you need to start defining metrics, you need to start defining trade-offs, you need to start defining what kind of data do you really need, what predictions you think are really going to be valuable. Um, so this is the first difference that I see, right? Uh, the product specification is a bit more complex uh, when it's an ML product. The second, maybe quite obvious, right, is that ML product or an ML team, it's all about the data. From a starting on, do you have the right data, right? If you want to make predictions, you will need a lot of historical data so you can train your models. Um, if you have the models, you have the data, but it's like garbage data, you can only expect to get garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, so you need to not only worry about you know, how the UX is, but you also need to worry how you are collecting this data, how are you validating it. Um, 
Yeah, you need to also not only validate your user journey or the UX, but you also need to validate the predictions that you're doing online, right? And I will talk ab uh, about this a bit more later. Um, and then, of course, product metrics, we always have them, but I think here they are even a bit more uh, important or critical, and you also have a lot more or a different set of product metrics, right? As I mentioned, all these prediction ones are is something maybe that you won't have if uh, if you don't have ML on your team, right? So discussing the trade-off, how are you collecting the data? Can you even start maybe without any data, without ML? And then also, of course, very important, how is this data being stored? Do you have any dependencies with other platforms maybe? The other difference is that you will go from what I call one to end user journeys, right? So in a classic development, well, you might have different scenarios or different journeys with uh, some if statements or some for whatever. And you will always know, right, where the user is going to end up. But once you have uh, machine learning baked into the product, the decisions stop being uh, binary, right? But you have a, a big range. So what do I mean? Maybe with an example, it's more clear. Let's say that you make a prediction for um, the best movie to watch next, right, on Netflix. Um, you might decide to show it as like a recommended movie when the model is 99% uh, sure of the prediction. But what happens if the model is 62%? Would you still present it as a good uh, movie to watch next, right? What if the model only predicts with 15% uh, accuracy? How do you phrase this? Do you present it? Do you don't present it? Maybe you want to use different copy depending on the the, the, the certainty that the model has, right? So this is what I think that it becomes a bit more difficult to, to map and differentiate all the different journeys that your product will, will have. Um, and of course, there is no no easy or no one way of finding what that right number is to start saying okay after this this is the best movie before this it is not right so it's a bit more more complex and you can see also how this influences you i think a classical example is on spams right um you develop a model and then the model will detect if an uh, email email is a spam or not at what point do you decide to phrase it as a spam Right, maybe if the model is 90% sure that it's a spam, then you put it in the spam folder and you label it spam. What if it's 50% sure that it's a spam, right? Maybe you decide to still put it on the inbox, but only with a warning, um, but you still let the user give you that feedback that actually this is a spam, right? So this is what I mean. You have to consider a lot more different scenarios once you have a model making a prediction and that prediction triggering an action. The next one is uh, about unclear technical feasibility and uncertainty. Again, product development in general uh, has a lot of uncertainty, of course, but I think it's maybe at this point a bit more clear what we can do uh, with development, right? And, and, and I think a lot of the applications will be things that have been already tried. Whereas we're a male, you might still face a question on, can we actually predict um, what we think we need to, to predict, right? So you need again a lot more data and experimentation to know how well your your model is going to perform on on live right and of course i think there is also a bit more extra uncertainty because when you test your new product you're not only validating if the value proposition is uh, the right one or if the copy is clear or if the ux is on point but you're all adding basically a new dimension right you're also adding are my predictions well so again, right? If I'm if I'm trying to predict what movie is uh, best to to watch, um, maybe the copy is great, the UX is perfect, but maybe the predictions that I'm making are are horrible, right? So then I will see that the test failed. But how do you really know that it was the predictions and it was not the UX, right? And there are a lot of different things that you can do, like testing this differently. For example, uh, at Booking we could test a ranking of hotels, and maybe it was just a random order. And then you test it against a uh, ranking organized by a model, right? So that you can really only measure what the impact is of a, of a new ML model. Um, here also you need to, to discuss with the team on like what kind of trade-offs you will make, right? So if you make uh, a specific prediction, what are the implications of it, right? So 
um, as I mentioned before as well, right? When do you make that cutoff on, on the predictions that the models are, are making? So now after highlighting these uh, differences with an ML team and a, and a classic uh, software development team, um, how can you add value right, to the team? And of course, to the ML team. Uh, first and foremost, you are still the, the the user voice in the team, right? So remember that there are no AI first products, right? If you want to build a successful product, it will always be a user first product, right? So even though you might find yourself discussing a lot more uh, about it, what technology to use and what model uh, you are using and so on, you have to remember that you're solving a user problem, right? Um, so that is Again, compared to maybe the data scientists, developers that will be on your team, you should be the user boss. Um, so, you know, what I, what, I, what I always show is that even though, of course, a lot of companies now mention that uh, they are AI first, again, you as a product manager should focus on your product being customer first. Um, and related to this, right, what you can start asking and making sure in the team is that you don't only work until putting a model live uh, but that you also make sure that you collect this feedback on your predictions right are we making the right ones are we are we explaining them correctly right and making sure that you prepare also the product for for it to be able to collect this feedback from from real users another very important point is also to discuss with the team and define together what the actual goal is of the team so this is I mean, you have to do it in any kind of product team anyways. But again, I think it's more important to define the goal and the metrics, right? So what, what are you really trying to achieve with the product? Uh, and what are the models actually predicting, right? Which can be something super different and that maybe you don't find out because you just don't ask, right? So an example can be uh, you are working... Uh, yeah, at booking.com, right? And the real goal of the team is to increase the amount of people that end up staying at the hotel, right? So not only booking it, but staying there, right? So without cancellations and everything. So that's your business goal. And now you're working on, on a new email campaign. So you need you want to build a model to decide what hotels to recommend on that email. You can train the model to predict which hotels are more likely to be click right? That is one prediction. You can train the model to display what uh, hotels are more likely to be book, but maybe not stay, right? What hotels are users more likely or less likely to cancel, for example. You can also predict what kind of uh, traveler uh, this user is, right? Maybe a family or a couple. So then you also show a different kind of hotels. So you need to make sure that what the model is actually predicting is really going to help the, the goal that your your product has, right? That again, they might not always be aligned and there might be a compromise because it's not easy maybe to predict something so close to your product goal, but at least to make sure that that prediction is really aligned with what you want to deliver at the end of the day, right? Um, how are the models performing, right? Discussing this with your, with your team, with the data scientists, like... How many times are our predictions on point, right? What is the distribution of the probabilities that we have? What happens when 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 there is new data or when some predictions are not right? Are we capturing that? How often does that happen? And so all of these should be things that you have a metric and you have defined and agree with the with the team, right? And very importantly, right? Of course, you need to define this before putting the models on production but also after going live, right? So you might see that during the test that you do while launching the product, um, let's say 20% of people click the, the movie that you are recommending to watch next. But this might change over time, right? If what your model was using were some parameters that maybe now the product is not collecting anymore, or maybe you know now with the changes in how we collect data with cookies and so on, Maybe the models don't have all the data that they needed anymore. So this can also change over time. And that's something that you always need to keep an eye on, right? To make sure that the model at the time that you introduce it uh, delivers value, but that it always that it also keeps adding value as time goes. Um, and then, of course, very important also to make sure 
of the, all the edge cases, right? So again, if you're working on making a movie recommendations, how many times do you get to have zero movie recommendations, right? How many times does a user has seen this movie recommendations more than 20 times? I've never clicked on one. Like, is that maybe a signal for you that those predictions are not right, or maybe you shouldn't even show it to them or that the UX is not right, right? So you need to also identify this um, and discuss and ask with the team on how you want to handle these edge cases, right? Because what I saw that will usually happen is that the data scientists will just focus on like how the model is performing, how it went on live, right? The designer, of course, will focus on the UX, the copywriter on, on, on the copy, but you need to be there to make sure that you connect all these dots and what happens, right? When, when there is no movie recommendation, do we still show something on the design? What do we say with copy? Do we say we found no movie recommendations or we don't show the blog at all? And again, how often that happens, for example, right? So you need to make sure that even though now you have this extra dimension of uh, predictions, that all the dots still connect and that you have also a, a, a proper user journey in place when, when that happens, right? Um, the next way of how you can add value, and I think this is very important, is on expectation setting with stakeholders, right? Um, again, you are using now a new technology. So this new technology also will represent or will bring a new kind of uncertainty and a new kind of blockers, right? You might now depend on people collecting certain data for your model or maybe on how to deploy those models and so on. So you always need to communicate this to, to your stakeholders, right? And it might be that sometimes your manager is not that knowledgeable of machine learning and what this means, right? So you also need to, that's what I put there, educate as needed, because maybe they will keep pushing you to deliver things faster. But just like when you work with product development, at some point you need to invest time in refactoring the code. With ML, there will be a new set of um, tasks that you need to invest time, right? So maybe you decide on next quarter to focus more on uh, cleaning the data, right? Or on collecting some kind of new data. And that will influence on what other tasks you can deliver. So you need to discuss this and educate a bit your manager so that they also understand uh, how you're investing your, your time. And then I think also very importantly, align on the trade-offs with your, with your manager and in the company, right? So one uh, example can be, um, for example, I was working on a, a product where we were doing some changes um, to, or we were in charge of getting payments accepted, right? So you can do a model and then you can see that uh, more payments were being accepted, right? Um, but there might also be an implication, right? That these payments later on get uh, canceled or get like a chargeback, right? Or maybe now you accept more payments, but they were actually fraud, right? So there is a balance that you need to, to put in place. And these are goals and metrics that of course you should be aligned with, with the company beforehand, right? If you introduce a model, you're introducing a change, it hopefully has a good impact on your metrics, but there will always be another metric that you always also need to keep an eye on, right? For example, again, if you're making uh, hotel recommendations, you might see that you increase the amount of bookings, but then also you might also increase the amount of cancellations that happen, right? Uh, so how do you balance those two? And again, how do you measure then and how do you uh, have the mechanisms in place to make sure that when one of those metrics goes, uh, uh, out of what you expect, that you you know it of hand, uh, beforehand, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, be aware of bias and think ahead of where it can go wrong, right? Um, we're working with data. There will always be bias and, on, on data. So, again, discuss it with your team, right? How are we dealing with it? Uh, what mechanisms do we have in place to make sure that we avoid action in, uh, on, on those bias that we might have on the data? Uh, does everyone is everyone aware of maybe aware of the what the edge cases are and again how are we going to handle them uh, and then depending on what are you doing with these kind of uh, predictions um, what uh, what kind of uh, mechanisms do you have in place to make sure that some predictions don't don't go wrong right um, or how what do you what pro processes do you have in place to make sure 
that there is the necessary uh, checks before maybe acting on, on something, right? So you, if you are working on something that is maybe a bit more complicated or more delicate, um, for example, you might decide that you need some manual intervention. And that is, of course, something that maybe the data scientist is not going to do. But again, you as a product manager might need to highlight uh, to the company. And uh, last, I think is, uh, of course, again, to to pressure on the team on, on making sure that you focus on the added value, right? Don't focus on the state of the art uh, machine learning, right? So, and this is, I've seen uh, a bit more critical when you maybe start working on a new product and you have the full team, right? So let's say you, you, you're working on a new product and you have three data scientists, two data engineers, right? That, that of course everyone will want to start putting uh, models out in production and you know everyone keeps learning about new technologies and we might be a bit excited to test that that um, latest uh, deep neural network technology but again right your the purpose of your product team is to deliver value is not to have the latest technology on on production right so one way how you can handle this and how you can make this also more transparent when discussing with your team is to really define up front and agree with them on again how are you going to measure that you are delivering value to the user and how are you also going to uh, define that a new model or a new technology is doing better than the existing one right so um an example right if you're working on making movie recommendations uh, are you going to accept that a new model is doing better if more users click on it or if more users end up watching the whole movie or if more users maybe stay longer watching the movie, right? These are all the metrics that can uh, trigger different uh, decisions and that can also decide what technology or what model you end up using, right? So the best thing that you can do is to define this up front, to define this together with your team. And then let this let this uh, be the, the factor that decides what technology you end up using on your product, right? Not just, you know, going straight to use the latest one. So finally, I just want to give some maybe tips or also as a, as a way of a recap on uh, the talk on what things you can go and apply tomorrow and then keep an eye on every day with your ML team. Of course, first and foremost, I tell everyone, go and talk with your data scientists, right? Depending on the setup of the product, you might be working with them. Maybe this might be like a data science agency that is uh, working closely with the team. But talking with them, I think, is, is the most important thing, right? So talking about what, right? Making sure that you understand the trade-offs, uh, as I said, right? So if we're making a movie recommendation only when the model is what number are we actually labeled in a movie as a good recommendation, right? This, you need to be super clear and aligned for them. Uh, understanding what the models are really predicting. As I said, right, you might get different results if the models are predicting what hotel is more likely to be click compared to what hotel is less likely to be canceled, right? So really align this. And how are all these predictions and all these trade-offs, how are these aligned to delivering value to the, to the, to the user, right? Uh, check your metrics. Do you have uh, metrics, numbers, mechanisms to, to store this data so you know how often you're making good predictions, how often the predictions go um, go to these edge cases, um, right? And then also I think it's super important for you to understand um, the pipelines, how the data is stored, how do we measure quality of the data, uh, are there new kind of dependencies because maybe there is another ML platform team, right? So trying to understand all the this technology landscape is also going to help you understand through uh, you know the effort that the team puts maybe uh, new blockers or configurations that you should keep in mind where, where, when planning uh, an next sprint for example right uh, and then i think of course super important and something that i see happen regularly we always focus on um the model does 80 percent of good predictions right so 80 percent of users see something very nice but what happens when it goes bad, right? We, we we tend to sometimes, oh, it's only 1% of the times that the prediction is off. Okay, fair, but what happens then, right? And as I said, making sure that all the dots are connected. What kind of copy do we show then? What kind of design do we show then? Do we call, what kind of feedback do we collect when these uh, predictions are off, right? So making sure that all of this is in place and making sure also that all the different um, 
disciplines uh, are aligned, right? That the data scientists discuss it with the UX designers, with the developers, how the data is safe and so on. Um, so these are things that you know you're gonna start acting on tomorrow. Um, that was uh, the talk. That was all the things I had to say. So thanks for your time. I hope this was uh, valuable. And as I said, if you have any questions or follow-ups, you can contact me through my website and yeah, we'd be happy to, to continue discussing. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.